I'm turning today to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13 and verse 1. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. The subject is God's rule over law and order. And this is a very remarkable chapter. We've been studying this great letter to the Romans. Uh, chapters 1 to 11 have the great uh, pronouncement of doctrine, the depths of God enabling us to understand more deeply the way of salvation, the way of the Lord. From chapter 12, the apostle turns to very practical themes. And we've looked at chapter 12 and studied those verses. And when you come to chapter 13, you get a great surprise. The unexpected appears. It is practical, of course. But what is the apostle saying? How is it he says such things as he utters here? But he speaks under inspiration. And this is the will of God, the mind of God, the purpose of God for his people. He is talking about obeying the civil power, as you well know, and uh, gives many clear directions with regard to that. But he's writing to the church at Rome. And he himself, the apostle, has known serious persecution, not only from Jews, but from Gentiles, from Romans. He lists elsewhere many of the sufferings he'd endured and the injustices and the wrong treatment from the Roman power and Roman authorities and yet uh, the behest of the Jews most often. But yet, he says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, before I embark on these verses, and uh, look at the surprising words that come. I remind you of chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to you, that ye present your offer, your bodies, a living sacrifice. And you know, we offer to God direct worship, praise and adoration. So there is direct worship in the Bible and which is so important to us. And then there is another form of worship, and that is the offering up of the life as a living sacrifice day by day. And that is particularly what the apostle embarks upon here in chapter 12, verse 1, that ye present or offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or logical or rational service, worship for him. Well, we we're engaged in direct worship this morning in this service. But have you offered up your life, even as a Christian, for him to be wholly his, to be chiefly his, and to have your life offered up day by day? And verse 2, we looked at that, be not conformed, shaped, fashioned from the outside by the influences of this world, but be ye transformed, and the word implies in the Greek, from within, by the renewing of your mind. And if you look through chapter 12, well, verses 3 to 11 have to do with our relationship to the church and to each other. And verse 12, in chapter 12, our relationship to our circumstances, which are expanded again from chapter 13, and then verses 14 to the end of the chapter, our relationship to our enemies, to our persecutors. And then chapter 13, our relationship to the civil, civic authorities. So it's continues really the theme of relationships, our attitude toward, our relationship with this, that, and the other. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Why should we be? Why should we, Christian believers, be subject to the higher powers? Do we not believe in the doctrine of two kingdoms? There is the kingdom of this vain world, 
and there is the kingdom of Christ. And we've been translated in scriptural terms into the kingdom of Christ. Why should we be so careful to be obedient to the laws of the kingdom of this vain world? Well, is it not true that we're not of this world? Why should we be so conscientious and so scrupulous? Do they not persecute believers? And particularly in the time of the apostle and in Rome, why there was probably a minority, but there was a good number of uh, converted Jews in the Church of Rome. They'd already been excluded with violence from Rome once, and now the law had lapsed and they'd been allowed back in the city. There'd be further persecution for them, and indeed for all Christians, savage persecution. Should they be obedient to their persecutors? And indeed, the rulers were utterly godless. They were polytheists, and they hated the Christian message in so far as they understood it. So they were against Jewish converts, they were against Roman Gentile converts, and yet let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. In fact, that's very firm. The apostle says everyone, converted people as well as unconverted people, unbelievers and believers all come under this instruction. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, obedient to the authorities, to the magistrates, to the judges, to the ruling politicians, to kings, monarchs, emperors. Let every soul, members of the kingdom, those who are against the kingdom, be subject to the higher powers, even unreasonable, ungodly, antagonistic, hostile, persecuting people. It's the absolute rule that is given for Christian people. Keep the laws. Because and the reason is given here by the apostle, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. This is a very difficult thing in persecuted places in the days when in the old Soviet Union, Christian people were persecuted and pastors were put in prison, sometimes hundreds at any one time, and there was great uh, savagery and indignity meted out to believers. You would think that the Christians would develop a them and us attitude, and they would think of the authorities as being in every conceivable way against them and antagonistic. And yet among them there was taught this very instruction of the apostle to be scrupulous in all reasonable laws. You cannot, of course, obey any law which is contrary to God's law. But insofar as you can obey the law, you do and you must. And you must never allow the them and us attitude to develop so that you're disobedient to God in this matter. So we study this this morning and some of the things that are given to us here. The powers that be are ordained of God. I ought to explain to what extent does God approve of and particularly appoint the powers that be. Well, this is a very poor illustration, but if you uh, paid a plumber to mend your boiler or your heating system or whatever, in making, in appointing him to do that, you don't approve his character. You don't approve his manner of life. You engage him as a plumber. He comes into your house. Uh, you may, like me, know nothing about plumbing. You don't have uh, uh, a detailed commission to him as to how he will go about it. In fact, every plumber does things wrongly if you believe the next plumber that you get. That's uh, the standard with many tradesfolk, isn't it? But you don't really determine what method, what technique he'll use or how he'll go about it. But you pay him, he mends your pipes or your burst, 
or your boiler or whatever, and, but you have appointed him, you have engaged him. And uh, if you don't, well, obviously the leak goes on or the system doesn't work or whatever. Now, this is not a perfect illustration because God is not like us. And if he appoints a ruler, well, he knows perfectly well his character. And he knows perfectly well how he'll go about it. And he is ultimately uh, Lord over all things. And he can stay his hand at any time he chooses to, and so on. So my illustration isn't perfect, because we engage the person who is going to carry out the repair in ignorance of who he is, what he's like, and how he will go about it. God knows all things and ultimately determines all things. But he is not the author of his plumber's sin, so to speak. He is not the author of anything he does which is wrong and unfair and unreasonable. And so always bear that in mind. But nevertheless, it is God who ordains the power and allows it whatever shape that power takes. And he does it by writing into the human constitution a strong, powerful desire for rule and for government so that we accept it. What a remarkable thing it is that God should do that. When you think of human nature, when you think of the fallen human nature that we possess, why we want self-determination. We want our own way. Left to ourselves, we cannot keep the peace with many people. We fall out with each other. We object to each other. We're offended by each other. Left to ourselves, there would be no government. There would be anarchy and chaos and outrage and the whole world would come to a standstill and there would be war all the time. This is human nature. You know it well. Don't say to yourself, oh, no, no, people are not as bad as that. You know we are. We know how objectionable a fallen human heart can be. And God has determined out of his great kindness for the preservation of law and order and peace, generally speaking, he has determined to put in to the human constitution a powerful desire and urge for and need of order and an acceptance of it. Now, we had the newspapers only recently saying that in Parliament, the opposition was going to tear, and I'm not making political comments, the opposition was going to tear itself apart. And there were opposite points of view. And how would this be handled? And everything would be chaotic there. It was the opposition in this case. And I'm not transmitting or indicating or hinting at any personal political bias in this. But at the end of the day, all, most of those politicians went through their various lobbies in perfect order and peace. Why? Because there is, though it doesn't always happen like this, there is, generally speaking, a powerful need of order put into the human heart by God. And that's how he operates. And that's how he calls his people to desire government. From time to time, it breaks down. If what we read is true, there is terrible disorder in Libya and also in Somalia. Has God's system broken down? No, it hasn't. Because yes, that is allowed to happen. God at times takes his hand off. And I won't give a reason for that or venture a reason for that. God knows what he is doing. And the effect on the other nations invariably is we don't want to be like that. And we're all the more confirmed in our sense of need of order and rule. So God may, for all we know, take his hand off sometimes, either because that nation deserves it, I can't say that, but usually, chiefly, I would think, in order to show the rest of the world that they need to cling more tenaciously to law and order. It's a kindness of God. 
It's something he does. He does it out of kindness or the world would be unbearable and be chaotic. He does it for his purposes because the gospel can be transmitted best so the scripture hints in conditions of peace and order and tranquility when believers can be free to evangelize and to witness and to live in order and uh, he does it to demonstrate his mighty power. People sometimes cry out, where is God in this tragedy, in that tragedy, when this happens, when that happens? But God is even demonstrating his power by keeping this turbulent world full of people who are out for self-determination and their own point of view, causing them to cohere and to maintain order and peace for their own good and for the good of the gospel. It's a demonstration of God's power. It's Christ's power in particular. We do not see him ruling wholly in this rebellious world, but we see signs of his ultimate superintendency and control, even in a feature like this, that sinful people want law and order rather than chaos and confusion determined by self-will. Let's look at these verses. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance, the order imposed by God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Well, I have to confess our much-loved King James Version has gone a little too far with the word damnation. The word is judgment. It comes from the Greek to decide, decision, the sentence of God, the judgment of God. And yes, people who resist the law receive to themselves a judgment from the state, but the implication here is that we should be disciplined by God as well. So if a Christian person wantonly feels above the law, even the lesser laws imposed by the authorities for safety and order in society, well, you'll come under the displeasure of God. Maybe you'll lose various privileges. Maybe God will make sure that you're disciplined for these things shall receive to themselves a judgment. Verse 3, the rulers in mind, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now for Christ's sake, they may be persecutors of Christians, but viewing us as people, then they're not a terror to us. It is remarkable that even in our own society, and it may not always be like this, but even in our own present society, the laws that are passed that are against God's law, the legalization of certain sins, in fact, the criminalization of people who in various ways will not go along with the legalization of certain sins, that's a terrible feature of the last days, and it's happening in our society. It doesn't take away our obligation to obey the powers that be in all reasonable and proper matters. And interestingly, you can see the control of God. If society had its way, it would be a crime for us not to teach and approve of homosexuality. But God limits things. It shuts people out of professions, shuts people out of being marriage registrars, for example. It may shut people out of the teaching profession before too long. But will it? Because God seems to control the authorities to some extent. And though they do show their true nature by passing laws, which we cannot obey and therefore we may lose some 
opportunities and access to some professions, it doesn't actually affect us in our personal lives. We're not compelled to commit those sins. It is, a, it is the mercy of God that people who would, if they had their way, want these laws to be far more extensive and draconian, only take it up to a certain point. So, by and large, generally speaking, we see the hand of God, even in rule, in evil times. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou, this is verse 3, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, or at least uh, not meet with disapproval. Verse 4, he is the minister of God. These are powerful words. He is the minister of God to thee for good. Just look at the number of t times this is stated. We've seen it hinted at in verse 1, in verse 2, but now in verse 4, he is the minister, that means the servant, the functionary of God to thee, and later in the same verse, it's repeated, for he is the minister, the servant, the functionary of God. That's amazing. And it's twice, and then down in verse 6, it occurs again, for for this cause pay ye tax also. For they are God's servants, functionaries, who attend continually or full time upon this very thing. So he's a servant of God. But he may be an evil man. He may be a despot. He may be utterly unworthy of any such office. But he's described as the servants of God. Look at it another way. It may be that a ruler in any land or rulers in many lands hate God. It may be, I'm not implying anything against particular rulers, I'm treading carefully, but it may be that a particular ruler hates God and is very proud and disdainful of God and contemptuous of God and against God. He may be whatever he says in his own heart a convinced atheist. Yet, he doesn't know it. He doesn't realize it. He's never thought of it this way. But actually, he is a servant, a lowly servant of Christ. He's under the judgment of Christ in the last day because he's never come to him by faith and repented of his sin and maybe never will. But, He's a servant of Christ. No, he says to himself, I'm a ruler. I'm a monarch. I'm a prime minister. I'm a president. Everybody is beneath me. No, you're under the rule of God. Don't you know that you're a functionary of God in your office? You'll be held accountable for what you did, for every wrong thing you imposed and you did. But actually, you're just serving his purposes. You're doing his bidding. You're there in order to keep law and order and to keep the country, generally speaking, out of chaos. And from that law and order comes, obviously, a stable economy and so on. A stable economy is far, far more dependent upon law and order than economic theory. That counts too, yes, we know. But it's far more dependent upon law and order with all the the best economic theory in the world, everything would collapse if there was no law and order. So you think of yourself as the president, God thinks of you as his menial servants, unwittingly carrying out his bidding. So look at it that way round, if you will. He is the servant of God, verse 4, to thee for good. God has appointed him to make your life much more congenial and orderly and peaceful, and not just for you, but for the gospel, for the church. He doesn't know it. He's God's servant appointed for the benefit of the church and for the efficiency of the gospel. That's the way we look at it. 
But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. But I want to come to verse 5. Wherefore ye must needs be subject to the ruler, not only out of fear for the punishment he can mete out, but also for conscience sake. This is vital to your conscience. Out of conscience you must obey him, and for your conscience sake, or benefit, or health and survival. And it works like this. If I am not conscientious in obeying the laws of the land, if I am not scrupulous and careful, I defy God. I cannot say, well, what's the law of the land? I'm not of this world. What's the law of the land? It was uh, created by a wicked person. What's the law of the land? It's the thing published by my opponents. So I will not apply myself to that. Well, if I don't, my conscience will be injured because it's God's will that I should. And because if I leave out of my life observance of a whole section of law, the civil law, then I've got to square that with my conscience. I get used to it. I am above law. I am above obedience to these things. It doesn't matter. I can do what I like. Well, that will injure my conscience. The conscience will not work properly if it's only applied to the things you want to apply it to. Oh, I will call upon my conscience to challenge me and to work for me and to hold me up from sin when it's spiritual things but not when it's civil things. Conscience can't work, cannot work like that. So it'll stop working at all. And you notice it. The person who goes about in life and cuts corners and says, oh, well, this isn't to do with God. This isn't spiritual. This isn't biblical. This is only the state laws, the state rules. A person who cancels out the operation of conscience there and plays fast and loose with the law, does exactly the same thing with spiritual duties and becomes a law unto himself and his conscience becomes increasingly disabled. So what the apostle says is very important to us as believers because we want the conscience to work for us, to be engaged by the spirit of God, to hold us up, but also for conscience sake. If you've seen a man or a woman who gives themselves over, even a Christian sometimes, to outbursts of temper so that they get to the point where they lose their temper involuntary, involuntarily and then they get to an even further point where they don't know they're losing their temper. And the husband or the wife says, you've lost your temper. I haven't lost my temper, they say, full of rage. What's happened to the conscience? They don't even know when they're doing wrong anymore. They don't even notice it. It's just an example of this disabling of conscience. And you go about your civil life, cutting corners, breaking rules. Well, soon you won't know when you're off track in your spiritual life, and you become a wanton person. So for conscience sake, not only to observe your conscience, but for the sake of your, the translators are quite right in picking up the thread of the original, to keep your conscience healthy, because it's what God wants of you, obey all reasonable and right laws for the regulation of society. Now, if there are visitors here who come from afar, don't go away and say to other people, ah, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the members and the congregation there don't keep the law because the pastor there devoted a whole sermon to it. This happens to us. We have visitors from afar, and sometimes, and they're very nice people, I've no doubt, but they think that the preacher is preaching about something because that's a big problem in the congregation. I'm preaching about this because I've come to it. We're on chapter 13. 
but nevertheless not because I think that our congregation is exceptionally bad at keeping the civil law. But nevertheless, it's vital information for us that we all need. And then I come down to verse 5, verse 6. For for this cause pay ye tribute, tax also. For they need an income and support attending continually upon this very thing. Verse 7, render therefore to all their dues. This is an important verse too for us. Their dues. We have debts. We have debts to God. You have debts to your husband that you have to pay. You have debts to your wife that you have to pay. Debts of kindness. A debt to cheer her up, to cheer him up. Debts to each other. We have debts to the authorities. Render therefore to all what is their due, their, your debt to them. Tribute to whom tribute is due, that's tax. Custom to whom custom, which probably applies in the uh, first century to um, uh, duty on goods purchased. If there was a VAT, so tax, money for people, uh, based on your income or your holdings or your land in those days, and poll tax and uh, custom, the ch excess charges you have to pay for various goods. Fear, to whom fear? That refers to respect and obedience to whom we should render respect and obedience. Honour to whom honour. You give value and dignity to people who are due that. And a ruler has value. He's God's servant for law and order and uh, for various other things too. For public services for the punishment of evildoers and the limitation of crime. He has responsibilities. Therefore, he's due to have a value assigned to him and to be acknowledged and to be recognized and to be shown deference for his work in that sphere or her work in that sphere. Honor. Today's society is... Uh, not in the habit of giving honour. And especially it's become a thousand times worse with the internet and with uh, uh, social networking and so on. People are less and less inhibited and inclined to give honour. And the media is shocking on this matter these days. Of course, rulers and leaders in a democracy should be open to criticism. And criticism is a public right, and it's our public right to have a point of view about what they do and to express it in a proper way. But it's not right to show contempt and ridicule and insults. A proper critique or disagreement is one thing, but to vilify and to belittle and to uh, insult is quite another. And the media does it non-stop. There used to be a great distinction between the so-called broadsheets and the tabloids, but there isn't anymore. They're all at it. And it seems that when you become a journalist, so often what you need to be good at, first and foremost, is being abusive. And the public have picked it up. And it's a dog's life, being a leader or a ruler or a politician these days, because of the mud that is slung, do we pick up the habit? Do you find Christians doing the same? The things that people say in their various posts and their Twitters, do Christians do it too? Well, the word of God has a command for us, and it's here. Yes, we're in a democracy. We may criticize. We may have differing points of view, but honor to whom honor is due. Maybe they're not worthy of honor in terms of being honored for their morals or honored for their deportment or their behavior, but they're entitled to honor for their job, for their work, 
to carry out their service as servants of God. For this cause, render therefore to all their dues, verse 7 and at the end, honour to whom honour. So we have to watch our tongues and our pens and be very careful. We can't go along with the freedom with which society vilifies and insults because that's against the word of God. And uh, we are to keep the law, to honour rulers so far as we possibly can and to show proper respect, honour to whom honour is due. And then I come to conclusion with the eighth verse. Owe no man anything. That does not mean you cannot have a mortgage. That does not mean you cannot have a proper loan. It does not mean you cannot have help. But the Greek could be better translated, do not go on owing people. In other words, we pay back according to our agreements. We keep the terms. We do not borrow either privately or commercially and fail to keep our promises and to honour our undertakings. The sense of the original is continuous. Do not continue owing. The implication being beyond that which is proper, but to love one another. And that confirms the interpretation because the opposite of loving one another is hurting or dishonouring someone. So it suggests that the non-payment is hurtful or not agreed to or is in violation of an undertaking. Owe no man anything but love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law, which is another theme that we'll come to. Let me move to conclusion on this note. The eternal Son of God, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who came from heaven to earth and lived a life of perfection and withstood all temptation, thinking of him being the one who ordains rulers, the Apostle Paul says God ordains them, but when we see God there, we must read Christ in particular because all judgment is given to Christ. That's what he tells us himself. All judgment is assigned to him. He is ultimately the Lord of law and order. And he alone merits such a position. He's been, he's not only God, but he is man. He's been in our world He's kept every right and proper and just law perfectly. He's withstood the temptations of Satan. His perfections are unchallengeable. He is the one true and just living God. Well, dear friends, think of this. Dishonored largely around the world, discredited, attacked, rejected by so many and yet we have this great token of his power and kingship operating under everybody's nose the imposition of the desire for law and order our stable societies with exceptions yes which only confirm the desire more strongly for law and order he, Christians look up and they say him, see him, and he has imposed his power on a reluctant world. And we give him the glory and assign the credit to him entirely. And we look forward to the day when his full power is manifested, when he comes again and draws all things to himself and brings the world under judgment and the bridal supper of the land, Lamb 
and the eternal glory. This is God's word to us. How to see Christ. How to value him. And how to keep the law. Let's close this morning with a hymn of commitment. It's hymn number 470. Hymn number 470. Jesus, Master, whose I am. <laughs>